This is a monthly program sponsored by Cohen Veterans Bioscience for the brain research and systems biology communities. Cohen Veterans Bioscience is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to transform research in veterans' mental health through translational research. We are fo focused on understanding the molecular underpinnings of diseases such as PTSD and TBI to better to develop better treatments and diagnostics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk you through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived in the Cohen Veterans Bioscience YouTube channel and our website. The presentation will be approximately 40 minutes in length to allow for Q&A afterwards. Please use the Q&A button to post a question for Dr. Kessler, Ressler. Today our speaker is Dr. Kerry Ressler. He's the Chief Science Officer at McLean Hospital and the James and Patricia Potras Chair of Psychiatry as well as the Chief of Di uh, the Division of Depression and Anxiety at Harvard Medical School. He is the President-Elect for the Society for Biological Psychiatry and has previously won a Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Award uh, as, uh, and is also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Ressler received his B.S. in Molecular Biology at MIT and his M.D. In, and Ph.D. in Neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. He is the author of over 200 publications in the field. In this webinar, Dr. Ressler will discuss the molecular, genetic, epigenetic, and neural circuit mechanisms underlying fear processing through an integration of animal models of fear learning and human genetic research. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Ressler to you. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Haas. I'm really delighted to be here today as part of the Cohen Veterans Bioscience Network webinar series. And I'm going to be pre presenting today um, a title called Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, Clinical Phenotypes, Intermediate Phenotypes, and how we can model these phenotypes to really make progress in the field from bench to bedside, translational neuroscience, changing the way we think about PTSD and changing our treatments and interventions. I want to start with just a diagnosis of PTSD to think about what is the problem that we're struggling with. Of course, PTSD can be thought of in many ways, but I think from the purposes of a research perspective, it can most clear, clearly be thought of as a pathological fear reaction in a, re a situation in which <clears throat> the person has been exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, actual or threatened violence. And in all of these cases, the response involves extreme and intense fear, often feeling as if they're going to die or see somebody else die. Notably, PTSD um, occurs in about 5 to 10 percent of the people who experience a severe trauma. But we also know that it is additive. So the more traumas you've experienced, the more likely you are to develop PTSD. There are a cluster of a um, variety of symptoms, including intrusive symptoms that are the most common re experience of traumatic events through nightmares and flashbacks, avoidance symptoms as people ex re-experiencing and reminders of the events, they start to avoid the people and places and things that remind them of those traumas. Negative alterations in cognition and mood related to trauma, this is the newest um, with DSM-5, um, the category of avoidance and numbing was split into the new category C and, and D to better capture the depressive like symptoms and decreased cognition and decreased mood symptoms related to PTSD. The good thing about that addition is that it is better captures the syndrome. The difficult thing is it makes it sometimes even harder to separate the comorbidity between PTSD and depression. And the final category um, may be the one that's most clearly biological in some ways, which is increased arousal, including increased startle, hypervigilance, um, sympathetic arousal, as well as emotional components of irritability, aggressive, and destructive behavior as well. Um, so we think of post-traumatic stress really as the quintessential disorder that is the intersection of genetics and environment. We think that most psychiatric disorders are related to genetics and environment, but for this one you have to have both. With about 10 um, percent again of people who have exper experienced tra trauma developing PTSD, but who develops it versus who does not is mediated by biology. There are many brain areas that are involved in in regulating PTSD, but an important note is this is, of, of all currently studied psychiatric disorders, particularly of the most common ones, one could argue that PTSD 
is amongst the most tractable from a perspective of neural circuits. And that's because we've been studying the neural circuitry of PTSD for a number of years, but also because particularly in the realm of fear and threat responding, this is an area that's really led the field of behavioral neuroscience for the last 30 or 40 years. And it really builds on over 100 years of work started by um, Ivan Pavlov looking at conditioned responses, conditioned emotional responses. The principal reasons we, talk, reasons we talk about related to PTSD are the amygdala, which I'll focus on multiple times throughout the, the talk, but that really is where we think about it's involved in the final common pathway of the fear reflex. The hippocampus modulates contextual learning, but also generalization and discrimination of cues, as well as the extinction of fear, the inhibition of fear. And the medial prefrontal cortex involves both the inhibition of fear, as well as the dorsal anterior cingulate, more the activation of fear as these push and pull the top-down emotional systems. So when we think about how do we how are we going to study PTSD from a perspective of modeling, we have to take a number of different things into perspective. Again, the primary goal is to have an particularly in the realm of animal modeling, to have an animal that we can both learn from the biology as well as use as a tool for testing new interventions and treatments and testing our hypothesis of our understanding of the biology. And there's several different ways of thinking about modeling, but the first level is um, taking is using what we call face valid or construct validity models. And these are models effectively where you're trying to give a mouse the equivalent of PTSD with severe stress. And there have been a number of these models that have been used repeatedly, social defeat stress, predator stress, um, things like putting a, a rodent in a cage um, next to a cat or social defeat where you might have a rat or a mouse be um, attacked by another rat or mouse. Also a mobilization stress and mobilizing an animal in a number of different ways for a one or two hour period that leads to a significant stress response. Single prolonged stress um, has three different stressors that are combined um, sequentially for a, a unique stress situation and chronic variable stress where one takes advantage of the unpredictability of multiple stresses over time. The advantage of all of these is that they can look a lot like PTSD. The disadvantage is they're complicated. And with animal models, one of our best points of, prog of progress is being able to use a reductionistic approach. So other ways of approaching the problem of PTSD is to really focus on models that don't model the entire disorder itself of PTSD, but instead model the intermediate phenotypes. And as I often say as someone who studies both animal models of fear and human fear, is that it is much harder to make an animal model of PTSD than it is to make an animal model of fear conditioning that models very well a human fear conditioning. And then we know preclinically that human fear conditioning is dysregulated in PTSD. Similarly, therefore, we can study the acquisition, the expression of fear, the inhibition or extinction of fear, the generalization processes, and the reconsolidation processes, and focus on neural circuits and molecular mechanisms that regulate these intermediate phenotypes with PTSD. So part of the field is struggling with which of these is the best way to go. There's, of course, other ways of approaching modeling. We know that other kinds of intermediate phenotypes like sleep disturbances, insomnia, hyperarousal, anxiety defined in multiple ways, as well as, again, depression-like symptoms defined in multiple ways also are all part of these clusters. We can take another perspective on the idea of modeling, which is less based on behavior and more based on um, the underlying mechanisms, one of those is circuits. So again, because we know the neural circuits of fear in mice and in humans, we can really work on the similarities at the circuit level. And finally, Cohen Veteran Foundation, you've heard from other webinars, is focused very much on the genetics of PTSD, and I'll talk more about that. But by identifying gene pathways in humans, um, we can understand the mechanisms of those genes in rodent models. And finally, um, understanding, it's important to remember that we may make as much progress in understanding resilience as we do in understanding pathology. So when we think about the development of PTSD, we can break it down in multiple different levels. And again, the more we can reduce this, the more I believe we'll be able to have a tractable model for understanding. So the first question would be, why do some people develop PTSD and others not? Well, we know there are pre-traumatic factors like genetics, child abuse, personality. There are trauma-related factors like the intensity of the trauma, the dissociation, the interpersonal events. And then there are recovery-related factors. People who have different biological predispositions for extinction of fear, cue generalization, poor discrimination, poor fear sensitization, etc. And these and in, in the um, concept of research domain criteria where we are trying to move away from saying PTSD is a thing and more talk about PTSD as a 
as a um, consolidation of a number of different syndromes or symptoms or intermediate phenotypes. We can break down PTSD into components that involve negative valence, lack of decreased positive valence, um, decreased function in some of the cognitive systems, increased arousal and regulatory symptoms, chronic pain, etc. So all of these are sort of working into ways we can think about modeling the distinct components as well as the combined components of the trauma. When I think about, um, to me, why I like focusing on the amygdala and on some components of PTSD, it comes down, I think, to the concept of a panic attack. Someone who has a panic attack will say, all of a sudden I felt dizzy. My legs gave out on me. I couldn't catch my breath. It felt like someone was choking me. I could feel my heart was beating, etc. And with panic attacks, you have a whole host of physiological symptoms of heart rate, abdominal distress, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, lightheadedness, etc. But you also have these conscious symptoms of decrease of fear responding and feeling afraid. But you can really think of a panic attack as a fear attack because it essentially is having this enormous fear sensation at both a physiological and a cognitive level. We typically associate panic attack with panic disorder, but it's associated actually with a whole host of fear-related anxiety disorders. With, pan with PTSD, the panic attack type symptoms come when the trigger or cue or the trauma reminder activate the sense of panic, the sense of reactivating re um, the fear memory. With simple and social phobia, it's the cues of the phobia, be they spiders or heights or being in social situations. With panic disorder, it seems that the panic comes out of the blue, but what we often find is that generally with panic, people first have a panic attack or a panic reaction in a situation that may make more sense, be it a period of depression or after a trauma or being particularly upset, but they don't, they tend to then generalize the cues from where that activated that panic attack. So they don't really remember why I had that attack. I just know that my body got upset next time that my stomach starts to get upset, maybe I'm going to have another panic attack again. And so this then sort of spirals so that they start avoiding places with agoraphobia that they last had a panic attack and it becomes a fear of fear itself. In all of these disorders, they're associated with hyperamygdala activation. And we now know from decades of work is that if we take the amygdala as a whole or the subregions of the amygdala and look at its downstream projection patterns, we see a whole host of projections to brainstem and subcortical areas that mediate all of the symptoms of a panic attack. So you could say that a panic attack is effectively the fear reflex gone out of control. And that really can subserve many of the intermediate phenotypes of PTSD from the, from the cardiovascular effects, the GI effects, the respiratory effects, the startle response, the social avoidance, the HPA stress response. So in this disorder, then, it, we can move back a bit and say, well, we, don't, we, we have a good idea now for what are the, the neural constructs that lead to the sense of fear itself and the panic response. But what's upstream about that? What's different between two people who develop PTSD? And based on this, we can um, have used, and the field has used, um, mouse models of fear conditioning as one way to get into this um, issue. And I'll come back to this momentarily. But the basic idea is that the conditioned stimulus, for example, a previously neutral tone and an unconditioned stimulus, say, a foot shock are combined at the same time, Pavlovian fear conditioning. And you can do this with a small number of training trials. And the thalamic and cortical areas that represent the, the, the neutral stimuli are paired in the amygdala with the thalamic and cortical areas that represent the painful or shock or traumatic information, such that in the future, after even one trial, Strong synapses, connections have now been made in the amygdala so that in the future, the tone alone that was previously neutral now by itself can activate all these hardwired downstream effectors. So I want to come back into how do we think about modeling PTSD in humans. And again, this is built on the idea that PTSD is not one thing, but is a constellation of things, of intermediate phenotypes and events that occur over, over a period of time. So that again, at the beginning, there is a pre-existing sensitivity for why one person would be at more at risk for PTSD than another. And part of that's genetic, 30 or 40 percent genetic, and part of it's environmental. We know, for example, that child abuse is one of the largest risk factors. We then know that the, the events of the trauma, the surrounding events of the trauma, the severity of the trauma all also contribute to the, those who develop PTSD versus those who recover. We know that consolidation is important. And this has been a huge area in the field of neuroscience to understand what are the molecular events that make a transient memory turn into a long-lasting memory and then perhaps an over-consolidated, too strong of a memory that becomes the memory of PTSD. Once the, once the PTSD becomes long-term, people express 
through all of the behaviors that we know of as these symptoms of PTSD. But these behaviors, the avoidance responses, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the startles, and the memories themselves, then seem to feed forward in a way that those who develop PTSD are more likely to generalize memories and become afraid of more and more things and start to avoid more and more places. It seems that when they remember it briefly and talk about it briefly, they sensitize and it seems to get worse. Those who recover, on the other hand, seem to discriminate. They say there's good places and bad places, safe places and dangerous places, but the whole world doesn't have to be dangerous. They also extinguish, and extinction is critical to understanding how fear recovery happens in a normal way. Pavlov defined it as diminished response to cues over time, and we think it's the basic circuitry and mechanism by which exposure-based psychotherapy tends to work. We used to think only a single small number of genes would be involved, and now we know it's going to be hundreds of genes. And one of the largest efforts in um, the field of psychiatry, the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium, was created to help understand the polygenic or multigenic risks for psychiatric disorders. And the best example so far is schizophrenia, where there have now been hundreds of, of identified, hundreds of identified loci and genes associated with schizophrenia. We're now well on our way to doing a similar thing in PTSD. The Psychiatric Genomic Consortium PTSD work group um, was created to do a similar thing. Find all of the people across the world doing genetics work in PTSD. Let's bring our samples together and really have powerful ways of understanding the genetic architecture of PTSD. And thanks to the Cohen Veteran Biosciences Center and NIH, we hope that within the next two years um, we'll be able to um, reach that 100,000. And a brief shout out for anybody who has PTSD samples, you have two days left to get uh, in on the first RFA to help get your samples genotyped. But we're not there yet. What we are excited about, though, is when we do have such a genomic architecture of PTSD, we'll be able to feed it back into these animal models and understand these neural circuits mediating PTSD and potentially make really rapid progress. So I'm just going to now walk through several different examples of animal models and how those fit together with some of what we understand in humans. A great recent review by um, Daskalaskis, Yehuda, and Diamond talked more about the face valid models of PTSD, and they particularly talked about the predator-based social stress, the predator sense stress, and the single prolonged stress. And the take-home message of this is that, um, one, they all they use fairly different approaches, but they all are extremely traumatizing. And they all share a number of components, including increased um, stress response, the cortisol HPA axis response, some of the anxiety measures. And some of them do have face validity in terms of responding, for example, with benzodiazepines to be to show decreased anxiety and some of the other effects. However, the field is still relatively young, and again, there's a fair amount of, of lack of clarity and agreement across groups for which of these is the best. And again, as talked about before, they're so complicated, it's hard to know, for example, with single prolonged stress, how important is the anesthesia? With predator-based cycle stress, does it matter what kind of predator? With predator scent stress, how is the predator scent given, et cetera? So there's a lot of variables that can get very complex, and it's hard to know where they best lie in terms of a regular a model that we could really roll out and use similarly nationwide. So again, I'm going to focus mostly on our own work from here on out, talking about really focusing on intermediate phenotypes. And so the intermediate phenotype that I was first introduced to and still remains near and dear to my heart and perhaps the most data exists on is that of acoustic potentiated startle. And this was really discovered by and built upon by decades of work by Michael Davis, um, originally at Yale and then at Emory. And what Mike Davis showed on the right was that you could really study the startle reflex in a mouse or a rat primarily in their work. Um, and you would do this by, again, doing classical fear conditioning like I showed you before, but instead of using freezing as the output, you look at startle. So an animal would um, be in a chamber, you would um, have a tone paired or a light paired with shock, and then you would test them. And now when they receive the tone, or the tone and the light together, depending on how you're doing it, you see an enhanced or potentiated startle. And what's exciting about the startle reflex, one, it has a lot of face validity in PTSD. Almost every PTSD patient are hyperarousal and they startle easily. Um, and two, they startle more easily when they're being reminded of the trauma. Um, and we know that the neural circuitry of the startle reaction, how the amygdala projections to the brainstem enhance the 
auditory startle reaction are very similar from rodents to humans. And so one example we can show in human subjects, we can measure the startle response with an eye blink is a way it's commonly done. And um, Mike Davis and Christian Grillon were some of the first ones to do this frequently. Um, and what we can routinely do, this is work by Tanya Ivanovich and Seth Norholm of Emory University, can show that we can replay a sound um, while the subject is looking at cues on a screen. And these are just shapes for colors. And if the cue was previously associated with shock, with not in this case, not a shock, it's an air blast um, to the throat. It's the unconditioned stimulus. It's not painful, it's just um, aversive, it's mildly aversive. Um, that everybody will startle more to the um, cues paired with the, sh with the aversive stimuli. But the pa patients with PTSD over and over across multiple studies um, startle more in this cued neutral conditioning laboratory setting than control patients, suggesting that something about the PTSD brain is wired at least in the state of PTSD, we think some of this reverses with treatment, but is wired to even new neutral stooge cues associated with aversive stimuli, one becomes over-responsive to those cues. And again, startle is one very re reproducible way across species with a lot of face validity for this intermediate phenotype. Extinction, as I mentioned, is I think one of the more exciting ones as well, because that's really how we um, treat patients is with prolonged exposure therapy. So a number of years ago, Mike Davis, again of, of the startle fame, um, worked on showing that extinction of fear requires activation of the NMDA receptor. So the NMDA receptor is a glutamate receptor. It's um, one of the most commonly understood receptors related to learning and memory and plasticity. And Bill Falls in Mike's lab showed that NMDA activation was required to inhibit fear. This is the way they did it. They trained rats to be afraid, shown by these two right red bars, and then they did fear potentiated startle. So the startle was played at the same time that a light was on that was paired with the shock. Then they, te then they gave them 60 lights in the absence of any shocks. So they, they um, gave the lights over and over again without reinforcement and then tested them the next day. And now the animals did not have an increased startle in the presence of lights. They weren't afraid anymore. But if they did the exact same experiment, but did it in the presence of AP5, which is an antagonist or blocker of the NMDA receptor, and then tested them again the next day off of drugs, so there's no active drug on board, they're just as afraid as they ever were. This experiment and many more follow-up experiments showed that habituating or extinguishing a fear response is not just a passive forgetting process. It's an active process of learning to inhibit the fear. Ten years later, David Walker, Kwok Tung Lu, Mike Davis, and I showed that you could flip this around and enhance it with D-cycloserine, which is a drug that targets the serine site on this um, NMDA receptor and makes extinction work makes the NMDA receptor more efficient. So to test this, we, instead of giving 60 lights, gave 30 lights, and now to, um, extinguish the animals. And again, you can get an extinction, but because we only gave 30, you only get a partial extinction. What's really nice about extinction and fear conditioning is they're dose responsive to the amount of behavioral trials. If you then do 30 lights in the presence of decycloserine to make the drug work better, you now, and then test them, they now show decreased fear. So we can show that we could push fear up or push fear down by blocking or enhancing the extinction process. And again, one of the reasons we used decycloserine was because it was already shown to be um, safe in humans. It had been used for 20 or 30 years as an anti-tuberculosis agent at a much higher dose. So with Barbara Rothbaum, we were able to say, can we enhance extinction of fear in humans? One of the best ways to study extinction in a laboratory model is virtual reality, because that way everybody can get the same pre-exposures, the same um, test exposures in the same post. So we did a study with fear of heights where people went up 30 floors on a, on a glass elevator. They um, would ride the elevator while, and then walk out on these catwalks while holding this bar and with the virtual helmet they felt like they were in the room and they could look down at the lobby below. Now if you're not afraid of heights, it's not a particularly stimulating environment. It feels kind of like a bad video game. If you are afraid of heights, it can be very aversive. And um, what they typically showed is it takes about eight sessions to get better if you have fear of heights. So in this study, we did just like the rats. We gave them a partial dose of exposure. Instead of eight sessions, we gave them two sessions. But we gave the two sessions each with a pill beforehand. 
Um, so one set, two sessions, one week apart, that either received the placebo pill and the desaglycerine pill. And we showed it in many ways, but the take-home message is those, when we brought them back a month later or three months later, those who received the desaglycerine making plasticity in the amygdala work better during extinction showed much less fear in the virtual environment. And this has now been replicated in a number of other fear-related disorders, including some with PTSD. Now, there's some where it hasn't worked as well, and we as a field are trying to understand this, and we think one of the differences is that NMDA activation can help both reconsolidate, strengthen memories with reconsolidation and weaken memories by enhancing extinction. And if the therapy is not, an, if they do not have adequate habituation or within session extinction to make progress within therapy, then the plasticity enhancement of NMDA can push can push it in either direction. So if they have a good therapy, it makes it better. If they have a bad therapy, it may make it worse. And so um, struggling with those kind of issues is where the field is, but I think it's a really exciting first example for us of how extinction in a rodent model could be directly translated to extinction in a human model. What about intermediate phenotypes related to um, brain activation? Um, we know, again, one of the more replicated findings, and this is a recent paper by Jenny Stevens and all, but there are many other findings um, throughout the country, that amygdala's activation when viewing fearful faces is higher in those with PTSD than in trauma controls. We can now do similar work um, in um, small animal magnets and pet machines where you can look at amygdala activation um, in a, a mouse or a rat. You can also do structural studies and look at differential hippocampal size or amygdala size or prefrontal size. So even independent of behavior, there are tools available to look at what are uh, manipulations that would decrease amygdala activation in the presence of a fearful cue. And this is just evidence from um, that showing the fearful faces task um, increasing amygdala activation across numerous studies, and Amita again had a very elegant review a number of years ago showing increased amygdala activation across a number of fear-related disorders. What about manipulating the amygdala or looking at amygdala interactions with the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. A number of studies, again, have shown amygdala activation um, both within PTSD, and this is a recent work from our group in emergency department study um, individuals, so we identified people after trauma. We then had them look at fearful faces at one month in a scanner and then look at their PTSD symptoms three, at three months. And what we found is increased amygdala and hippocampal activation to viewing fearful cues at one month after trauma predicted PTSD three months later so that they were already on the trajectory. Can we use mouse models to target the, the recovery from fear or the enhancement of fear? And we certainly can. And some of the tools that are starting to become available, like optogenetics, which I won't have time to go into today, but has to be probably heard, um, identified by Kal Nesseroth, Ed Boyd, and others, allows us to use a genetically altered um, channel that is light sensitive. So you can make cells in any other part of the brain that expresses this um, externally delivered virus based receptor to the cells. And then you can shine a fiber optic light or laser down to that area and make the cells fire artificially. And one study that we did um, by Aaron Jasnow and others in J Neuroscience showed that if you um, activate a specific set of cells that we think inhibits the amygdala, the fear-off population, you get a very strong inhibition of fear and an enhancement of extinction of fear. And these kinds of tools are starting to allow us to ask how the prefrontal and the hippocampus regulation of increasing or decreasing fear can be examined in a mechanistic way and in a circuit-based way. Other parts of the brain are involved too. I haven't talked much about the um, nucleus accumbens and the striatum, but again, there's studies showing that they are increased normally with reward, and in PTSD, they have decreased. So again, the anhedonic or depressive part of PTSD can be studied in human and animal models, focusing on these brain regions as well. And what about top-down regulation? Well, I mentioned um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex inhibiting the amygdala, and again, um, traditionally, um, we see that when the amygdala is inhibited or behavior is inhibited, the medial prefrontal cortex is more activated. And a study by Yovanovitch and colleagues showed that in patients with PTSD who have decreased extinction of fear, they also have decreased activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex when performing behaviors regarding revolve 
involving behavioral inhibition, like a go no go task, is consistent with a decreased top down regulation. The part of the brain that seems to be, of the rodent brain that seems to be most associated with this medial prefrontal area is the infralimbic cortex. And this is a study from Vadim Bolshakov showing um, in which they were able to target the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, projections to the basolateral amygdala, and do a whole host of studies to understand how this particular projection pattern using. Um, genetically altered viruses and lasers directly inhibits the amygdala. So it's a remarkable convergence of where the field is in terms of being able to identify specific regions involved in fear responding, how those circuits are working together, and use the most cutting edge tools to manipulate them in ways that help us better understand the circuit. Um, this can also be done in the dorsal anterior lateral circuit, which is involved in enhancing fear um, in humans, and we and others have shown it's involved in enhancing fear in rodents. Similarly, the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress axis, the cortisol axis, is involved and very similar in humans and mice and another intermediate phenotype by which one can look at regulation of a stress axis. Some of the most um, old, the older work um, or early findings in PTSD showed smaller hippocampal volumes in PTSD, which we think are a combination of decreased neurogenesis and increased neural atrophy as a function of stress. Um, and these have also been replicated in animal stress studies. I'm going to move on um, to talking about convergence studies. How can we use genes found in humans combined with genes found in animals? And one example was where we took um, a, a genome-wide association study of PTSD um, and took the top genes from that genome-wide association study and asked of those genes, are any of those also highly expressed in the amygdala or, more importantly, differentially expressed in, in the amygdala after their fear conditioning or extinction? With the overarching hypothesis being some genes associated with PTSD are likely also involved in the intermediate phenotypes of fear responding or extinction responding. And this led to a gene pathway called um, the PACAP receptor. And um, I had, didn't really know anything about PACAP when we started doing this work, but what we've, you know, others had shown is PACAP is a very important hormone that is in part involved in stress as well as a number of other things, but is upstream of the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis, also directly acts on the adrenal gland, and is related to cortisol, epinephrine and norepinephrine, cardiovascular responding, and many of the stress and fear-related responding in humans. So since this study um, a few years ago associating PACAP differential expression with PTSD, particularly in women where we see a different estrogen sensitivity of PACAP, there's been a whole host of studies showing the role of PACAP in fear responding in animals and in humans. So again, a way in which using a convergent approach to ask about genetics and humans associated with PTSD and genes associated with these intermediate phenotypes may lead to very interesting target candidates. More recently, we're looking at um, in where we can even more closely um, look overlapping models is we can take human R blood RNA within one to two hours after a trauma in the emergency department and look at genes that are differentially expressed within the group that develops PTSD versus the group that does not develop PTSD one month later. And we can similarly say, how do those genes in the human blood one hour after trauma overlap with mouse genes in mouse blood one hour after a trauma model or a PTSD model? And early work, um, unpublished work, is already suggesting that a whole host of inflammatory genes may be shared between the human and the mouse model, as well as a set of interesting genes related to development and neural function. So I want to close then with where the field is going. I've talked about a lot of main brain regions, the amygdala, PTSD, prefrontal cortex that are all differential and hippocampus. But what's exciting about the animal models is we can get so much deeper. Although we've talked about the amygdala as one thing, it turns out it's a whole bunch of different nuclei. And there's a lot, many different genes that are differentially expressed in all of these nuclei. And we're starting to understand their function. Um, such that um, already there's um, maybe 10 or 12 different subtypes of cells being understood within the lateral amygdala, the basolateral amygdala, the output nuclei of the amygdala. And in some cases, we're identifying their specific functions. And it turns out that different cells that are different developmental and genetic functions lead to opposing behaviors. One of the most interesting stories in this area is from Cyril Harry and Andreas Luthi in Switzerland, where they recorded blindly from neurons um, pyramidal excitatory neurons and basolateral amygdala of rodents. And what they found was about 30% of the cells don't respond to fear cues at all. About 30% respond strongly to fearful cues. But another group of them don't respond to fear cues in Italy initially, but after the fear has gone down and the fear cells don't respond, this other cell type does respond. So they call these fear off or, or inhibitory extinction neurons, such that when the fear develops, 
the fear neurons start to fire to the fearful cue, but with extinction, those fear neurons decrease. But with extinction, this other set that was previously a latent set, you didn't even know it was there, starts to fire, representing the inhibitory memory. And our question was, are there molecular markers of this population versus this population? And if there are, can we use those molecular markers specifically to target the inhibition of fear and to, to make to have drug or re receptor-based therapeutic approaches directly acting on inhibition circuitry. So we don't have time to go into the details, but again, this is an optogenetic approach. We have a specific cell type called the Phi-1 marked YFP cell type that makes up maybe 30 to 50 percent of the pyramidal neurons within the amygdala. And we showed with Tig Rainey's lab that these were responding to um, in an optogenetic fashion to, to light activation. And more importantly, that when we activated these cells, it inhibited the, the amygdala output cells electrophysiologically. And Aaron's data, as I showed a minute ago, suggested that if we activate the fear off cells at the same time of fear conditioning, we can effectively block fear memory formation. The new data are, Ken McCullough in our lab is doing studies in which he's now using fax machine sorting to sort these fluorescent specific fear off cells and identify through RNA sequencing what are those populations. And he's come up with a whole host of genes that seem to be preferentially expressed in this cell population in the amygdala. And as a proof of concept, he was then able to say, let's take one of the receptors that is druggable, already has known drugs targeting it, that we identified from this RNA-seq unbiased approach, and now target that drug and see if it works in the predicted direction. Again, these are fear off cells we predict. We've identified an activating receptor on a fear off cell, used a drug that we've never used before, um, and shown then when we do fear conditioning with the drug on, and then it tests with expression, we completely block the fear, consistent with the idea of a genetically driven circuit that we can start to identify new genetic pathways that both increase or decrease fear, and from that process have new targetable therapeutics based on these intermediate phenotypes. So we'll just wrap up with saying we can model PTSD in a number of different ways, from face valid models that have the, in, incorporate the complexity of PTSD, but which also by incorporating the complexity of PTSD may be harder to, to dissect, to more intermediate phenotype models that may allow us to dissect the subcomponents of PTSD, but those have the limitation of not having all of the components of the disorder together at once. This work has been done by a whole host of wonderful students post and postdocs. Um, in particular, I pointed out work by Aaron Jasnow, by Kenneth McCullough, by Brian Diaz, by Jenny Stevens, and we'd particularly like to um, thank the Grady Trauma Project and um, the inner city um, at risk um, cohort that we have worked for over 15 years with to try to better understand the role of PTSD in um, urban dangerous environments. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ressler, for a very comprehensive overview. Um, we will now open up the lines for questions and answers. If anyone has a question they'd like to direct to Dr. Ressler, please use the Q&A button and you, you may type your question in and uh, we will respond. And while we wait to see if we have any questions on the line, I'll start by asking you, so uh, what you've outlined here very elegantly is uh, our ways and mechanisms to uh, evaluate circuits and also the interaction of circuits and genetics and, and expression factors uh, to interrogate um, different systems that might um, be involved in the PTSD etiology and, and um, even consolidation of fear. I'm wondering um, what your thoughts might be about looking at other uh, potential mechanisms like inflammatory mechanisms and metabolic mechanisms uh, that relate, uh, that may relate to some of these conditions and whether there's any research being done on that front. Absolutely. Um, thanks again for hosting me, Magali, and great, and great question. So no question that inflammation is huge. Um, we're seeing it, we and many others are seeing it in the periphery in humans and in animal models where we look for it, we see inflammatory approach um, changes in the brain as well. Where I think the inflammation field is going to be particularly exciting is when we can really start understanding how are these cytokines and inflammatory circuits directly acting 
on the neural function and neural circuitry that we so well understand related to the fear behavior. And there's data that um, inflammatory markers can directly activate amygdala cells and that they can inhibit um, some of the prefrontal and hippocampal top, top down cells. So I think it's a big tent that will allow the um, combination of our understanding of peripheral and central inflammation and glial function with the specific circuits that modulate fear related behaviors. Um, and I think metabolic things are the same way. We're increasingly seeing ghrelin and leptin, um, somatostatin, cholecystokinin, all sorts of peptides that we know regulate metabolic state, regulate GI state, are critically also involved in regulating hypothalamic, amygdala, and other limbic system processing. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow that up with a, a subsequent qu question. That's, uh, so based on that, um, it sounds as if we have a very target-rich environment for intervention. Uh, do you have any any recommendations for companies that have potentially uh, compounds and therapeutic approaches that might be useful, but they don't know where to target? Um, how would they prioritize um, their programs? Should they be looking at uh, fear conditioning? Should they be looking at inflammation mechanisms, genetic mechanisms? Um, I yes. think you understand my question. Yeah, exactly. So I think one of the limitations of sort of the first generation of psychopharmacology um, where you know we had SSRIs or we had antipsychotics, and then the thought was let's identify one behavior that responds to SSRIs um, for swim, for example, or antipsychotics, say you know stimulant locomotion, for example, and then try to create a whole host of drugs that did the same thing, and they were successful in finding a lot of drugs that looked like the original drugs, but it was very limited then in this almost artificial model. And I think what's great now is because the neuroscience is driving these multiple models, that one, I think we need to make sure we carefully don't too quickly adopt any individual model. I think they all add different amounts of richness. And if there were only one or two targets, we might have to be more selective. But since there are potentially many, many targets that can start to be driven by the genetic pathways, I think we can then be pretty um, rigorous and say we need a we ideally need a drug based on these prior identified targets from the human genetic, the human omics studies, and the mouse omics studies that hits multiple components of these intermediate phenotypes and ideally the face valid stress phenotypes as well. But in the best case scenario, having both combinations of models, the intermediate and the face valid models, would allow us to really understand both efficacy and mechanism at the same time. Thank you. And we have a question from our audience. The question is, concerning pre-trauma factors, how important is it, do you think, to study effects of trauma and stress on gestation? Um, I think mean, they're terrific. If that's so one of my friends out there doing placental work, um, there was two, to, two or three talks at ACMP this week um, um, on the role of um, gestational stress, placental stress, other things. I mean, they're they're critically important, and and I think um, the pre-trauma factors certainly include childhood trauma, but plenty of animal models and to some extent human data where it exists, so that gestational trauma as well as prenatal trauma, as well as potentially even intergenerational trauma, some that we've worked on some as well, are all important. So. Um, you know, I think there's two kind of parts of the question. One, how do we understand how it all works together? Um, and more trauma generally is bad. Um, but then at a practical level, how do we intervene? And maybe the most important question is when we're thinking about interventions, does trauma related to adult does PTSD related to adult trauma only have a very different biological signature than PTSD related to a ch child plus adult trauma? And is that different than prenatal plus adult trauma, et cetera. And that may lead to different biological approaches. We don't seem to have any other questions from the audience, uh, so I'll ask you one final question. Um, reverse engineering from the human data, you had mentioned that there is a human genetics of study program underway with the Broad. Um, how would you use the findings uh, from the human work uh, to inform your animal studies? Absolutely. I think there is a whole set of ways to do that. So certainly the most low-hanging way is um, 
if when we get to 100,000 samples, if we follow anywhere near the trajectory that schizophrenia has followed, we would anticipate somewhere between 20 and 50 um, polymorphisms that are associated with PTSD. What we would immediately do as a field then is start to look at what are the mechanisms of those, um, how do they work, and how can we target them. But what I think is so exciting about PTSD, more so than almost any other field, and certainly with the other GWAS um, initiatives in schizophrenia, depression, autism, the, the difficulty with all of those disorders um, is that we don't have nearly as well worked out uh, neural circuitry as we do with PTSD. So I think what having the large-scale human genetics data will do is allow us really to understand quickly how those specific gene pathways are working within a well-known circuitry so that we have a much greater understanding of the targetability as well as the function. And then I think other kinds of approaches such as, say, in addition to the top genes, can we use a polygenetic approach and say, the, you know, all the genes that are less than 0.07, 10 to the minus 7th or whatever, how do those convergently interact with the um, with the animal model genetic data as well. We seem to have another question, but I can't pull it up. Uh, someone else just sent in a question. It popped up on mine and then went away, but it was related to hippocampal size, but I'm sorry I didn't see the second part of the question. Whoever you are, I'll send it again. <laughs> Not on the UNA. Um. I don't. I, I'll, I'll 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 wax philosophic for a second about the hippocampal size, and maybe we'll capture their question within it, um, which is that it's certainly one of the more interesting pieces of data. Doug Brenner did a lot of the early work. Um, probably the strongest data are that it's associated with smaller hippocampal vol volumes associated with childhood trauma, but it's certainly associated with adult trauma, PTSD as well. And I think one of the most interesting pieces, although the sample sizes are few, um, is that it at least one study suggests that paroxetine-based um, treatment that leading to recover or at least partial recovery from PTSD was also associated with a recovery of hippocampal volume, suggesting that these are really dynamic processes. Um, and Bruce McEwen and others have done a whole host of work on the retraction and then the re- um, expansion of dendritic trees and things like that. So I think one of the most important take-home messages of all of this is I think neuroscience is really going to provide promise to understanding that what we once thought might have been, you know, an incurable disease can really be attacked in multiple creative ways. I'll have clarification on the question and I'm going to expand on it. The question was it is unclear whether hippocampal size is a risk factor or an effect of PTSD, um, and whether animal models have shed light on this question. Yeah, great question, and and it's again been one of the critical questions since people started finding this observation. Um, one of the best studies um, in humans was by Roger Pittman a number of years ago, I believe in Nature Neuroscience, but um, un it was underpowered and thus has had some criticism, but it was a very elegant study. They took um, twins who um, were both involved in the military, um, one of whose saw combat, um, no, I believe they were all combat exposed. There was combat exposed twins and non-combat exposed twins. Um, and of the combat exposed twins, um, one of them had PTSD and one didn't. Sorry. <laughs> the ta I'll give you the take home so that I don't screw up the, the experimental design. The take home was that non-combat exposed twins who were the twin brother of a combat exposed twin with PTSD also had a smaller hippocampal volume than the non-combat exposed twin um, com who was the brother of a combat exposed twin with PTSD, suggesting that the hippocampal volume size was the pre-existing factor and then that the exposure to trauma allowed for the PTSD to develop in the presence of a smaller hippocampal volume, which again is associated, we think, with more fear generalization, decreased fear extinction, etc. That said, there's also a lot of data showing that childhood trauma and adult and, and other kinds of stresses and trauma can lead to smaller hippocampal volume. So it may really be a combination of both of those things. There may be both traumatic and genetic factors leading to hippocampal function and volume. So put another way, if someone uh, was experiencing chronic stress uh, and PTSD over their lifetime, do you feel that uh, there would be a neurodegenerative process that's being initiated, um, and is that a mechanism that would potentially explain the 
the hippocampal volume changes. That's certainly one way it's been interpreted, that chronic stress really is neurodegenerative. Whether it's neurodegenerative in the dementia perspective in terms of cell death, or whether it's neurodegenerative in terms of the decreased dendritic tree, which then can be, be regrown, is, is not so clear. But there are separate data that PTSD does put one at increased risk for dementia as well. Um, whether it's through those exact mechanisms or others is not clear. Well, we've, we've run out of questions from our audience. I want to thank you once again for an outstanding presentation and for taking the time to join us here today and for the ongoing partnership, Dr. Ressler. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure, and thanks for Cohen Veteran Biosciences' interest in this fascinating and very important field of PTSD. Oh, you're quite welcome.